My name is Diane Seidel. I'm with the NOAA Air Resources Laboratory in College Park. And um, the title of my talk, which is slightly misspelled here, <laughs> is actually the conclusions of my talk. Um, basically, it is that uh, the albedo variability limits the potential for detection of engineered, not engineering, increases in reflected sunlight. And this is work that I um, did with uh, Graham Feingold and Andy Jacobson of NOAA and Norm Loeb from uh, NASA Langley. And we're asking a very simple question here. We're asking whether the effects of solar radiation management or sunlight reflection methods or whatever you want to call that form of climate engineering on albedo could be detected, could be detected with, the, uh, with satellite observations of incoming and outgoing solar radiation. So a, a quite simple question, and the answer is um, basically it depends. And of course, as you would expect, the, the potential for detection depends on the magnitude of the SRM intervention and its duration, and it also depends quite obviously on the existence of a sustained observing system. Um, this work was published uh, last year in Nature Climate Change, so I'll be giving a, a basic overview, but details are, are contained in that article. Um, so, uh, as you probably are all aware, uh, solar radiation management is basically uh, based on analogs of natural uh, processes that reflect sunlight. For example, the injection of stratospheric aerosols are, is uh, a, an analog to the reflection of sunlight by, for example, volcanic aerosols that are injected naturally into the stratosphere. Changes in surface um, albedo uh, uh, that are um, deliberate uh, are similar to change, or are meant to be analogs of, of changes of surface albedo due to changes in, for example, snow cover and ice and uh, terrestrial biospheric uh, albedo issues. Um, so uh, we are then asking the question whether any engineered changes could be detected. And when we, when we talk about detection, I, I want to clarify what we mean by that. Um, basically, uh, one would want to be able to detect whether any potential experiment of solar radiation management or deployment in the long term uh, was had, had any efficacy, meaning that it, it produced the effect that was desired, and the, the direct effect that's desired is an increase in planetary albedo or reflectivity. Um, also, one would want to be able to attribute any changes in surface climate, for example, temperature, precipitation, or even the, the ocean effects that we heard about earlier in the session um, were linked to the intervention through the mechanism of increasing the planet's albedo. So it's the albedo that fundamentally is of interest in these other things, although they are what matters to human uh, society, are sort of fall-off, uh, uh, follow-on effects of the albedo change. And then also uh, there's an interest in knowing whether any potential undisclosed or unagreed to uh, um, climate engineering activities could be detected with the current um, technologies that we have. So we're looking at the detection problem in the classic sense is a signal to noise uh, problem. So first of all, a signal is produced, we assume, by, by the intervention that's attempted. And then we would like to observe that signal. And, and the observed signal must also be large enough to exceed the background noise in albedo. Um, and also, we, we sort of come at this problem thinking that the detection problem should be straightforward. You shouldn't have to do a lot of very fancy and complex data manipulations in order to uh, have the signal emerge. It should be something that's easily explained to, to scientists, but also to the lay public, because this is a, well, I'm sure you can appreciate why that would be <laughs> something desirable. So we're using observations, actually, to, to address this question. Um, and we're going to uh, simulate uh, solar radiation management using observations. And the observations we're using, we're very fortunate to have a very high quality set of uh, satellite data from the Clouds and Earth Radiant Energy System um, project uh, series. And uh, that is uh, a very uh, well quality controlled, long-term record, well, long-term starting in 2000 and coming up to present, and it's global, and so it's wonderful for our purposes, and we're using two uh, bits of data from, from that project. It's the incoming solar radiation uh, to the Earth and the reflected um, outgoing shortwave radiation, and the ratio of those two uh, is, of course, the albedo. 
Um, and this, uh, if this works for us, mm, very nice. Okay, these are the series data that we've processed uh, to show you what the vi background variability in albedo is. And this little animation goes through the period 2000 to 2013, and the brighter colors are the regions of higher albedo. And uh, these are not anomalies, these are just monthly mean values at one, one degree by one degree resolution. And what you can see is uh, seasonal changes. <laughs> For example, in the regions that are being shown now, um, this is where sort of the wintertime albedo get, gets higher than in the summertime because of the movement of the snow and ice regions further south in the northern hemisphere. Um, you can see uh, movements associated with uh, clouds in the tropics. And so this is what we're thinking of when we talk about the background noise that must be exceeded by a solar radiation intervention. There are some regions of the planet, um, the Pacific, tropical Pacific Ocean is a particularly dark region, so that might be a place of interest. Um, and um, I guess that's all I'll say about this animation for the moment. Okay, moving along. So our approach is to take those data that I just showed you, that long record from series, and w using those data to simulate SRM, uh, solar radiation management in the observational record and use st simple statistics. In fact, we use a student's t-test um, to test the significance of, an, of a, an artificial increase in albedo. And we do uh, a large number of tests in order to try to um, quantify the detection limit. Uh, of, a, of an induced you know, increase. We recognize that our methods, uh, that our results are going to be sensitive to this methodology and to a lot of basic assumptions that underlie the study, but we consider these results as sort of initial ballpark estimates of the kind of magnitude of albedo that might be detectable with the current observing system. And just for background, some useful numbers that you should keep in mind. Um, in, in our work, we're, we're talking about albedo as ranging between zero and one, so not as a percentage, but as a, a fraction of one. Uh, the global average albedo, as most of you are aware, is about 0.29. Um, uh, estimates have been made of, of the equivalent uh, equivalence of um, sort of relating albedo changes to uh, CO2 radiative forcing. So a doubling of CO2 is considered to be about four watt per meter squared radiative forcing, and that's the equivalent of um, an in, uh, well of a decrease of albedo of about of a 0 0.01. So that number 0 0.01 you'll see come back uh, a few times in this talk, and so you might want to keep that one in mind. And it comes back immediately. That is the estimated increase in albedo that uh, um, occurred in the tropical region following the eruption of Mount Pinatubo in 1991. Um, there was a very nice paper by Lenton and Vaughn, a sort of a review paper where they uh, went through various proposals for potential solar radiation management activities and um, estimated the albedo changes that might result, uh, both in a local region and then scaled up to the global average. And what I'm showing here is their estimates, the range of estimates of the kinds of changes that might be uh, conceived of in terms of what, what affects uh, SRM could have, so they range over several orders of magnitude, with the largest being about 0 0.01, but some being several orders of magnitude smaller. And then the effects on the um, global uh, albedo um, also ranging from a very small number up to about 0 0.01. That's just background numbers for you. Um, so first of all, let's just look at one region of the Earth, the tropical belt, and we're going to uh, um, uh, First of all, we're going to assume that we have an observing system in place and it's been operating for at least five years in order to quantify the, the variability in the system without the uh, geoengineering. And then we're going to increase the albedo instantaneously and we're going to sustain that in, instant um, increase over a period of a year. It won't be damped over time. Uh, and we're going to ask the question, what is the maximum albedo increase that would be needed in order to detect that change within one year period? So the region of the Earth that we're looking at is here. Um, it's the uh, plus or minus five degrees around the equator. And what's mapped behind it is just the um, standard deviation of albedo uh, <coughs> coming from the series data. So you see that there's some variability in that. And, um, uh, and one of the regions of lowest vari standard deviation is, is here in the Pacific. But we're looking at this whole equatorial belt, kind of like what might occur in a tropical volcanic eruption. 
So what I'm showing here are two time series based on the series record from um, that part of the world. On top in blue is the uh, time series of monthly mean albedo. And you can see that the mean value is about 0.24, so about a quarter of the sunlight reaching that part of the world is reflected away immediately. And then on the bottom, we've removed the mean annual cycle from the time series above, and so you're seeing the monthly anomalies of albedo, and you can see how they vary, uh, but about plus or minus 0.01, the standard deviation is about 0 0.005. So we're going to use this anomaly time series. Um, on basically, we're assuming that in a detection problem, we could, we could easily remove an expected mean annual cycle, but we could not easily remove these interannual variations. So we're going to work with this anomaly time series as the background noise. And what we're going to do is we're going to increase the albedo for a one-year period. So for what I'm showing here is for the year 2006, we've just added 0 0.01 in this case, an albedo increase of that value for one year. And we do that for every single data point, well, not every single data point, every single data point for which there's a five-year period before that period, before that intervention. And we, so we have a lot of different iterations of that particular test. And then we test whether the mean value during that one year um, is statistically significantly greater than, so it's a one-tailed test, um, than the period before. Uh, and we do that for many different um, values of the albedo increase. So you can see we're generating a lot of numbers here. Uh, and with those lot of numbers, we come up with plots like this. So on the x-axis here is the magnitude of the albedo change, and it's ranging over three orders of, net of magnitude in, in this uh, plot. And then we, we look at the probability of detecting that change, and the probability is based on the results of that t-test. If the t-test is significant, we've detected it, and if it's not significant, we have not detected it. So as you would expect, for a very small increase in the albedo, the likelihood of, per of detecting that change, statistically speaking, is very small. And as you increase the, the intervention magnitude, it increase the, the detection probability increases accordingly. By the time we get up to a 0.1, um, increase, we've, de we've got a 100% opportunity of detecting that. And what we've done is define the 95% level just nominally as a, the detection limit. So in this case, by 0 0.01, uh, we call that the detection limit for a, a SRM intervention in the tropical region. And we've also done similar um, kinds of uh, tests using the finer resolution, one by one, one, one degree latitude by one degree longitude data. And what I'm showing here are the detection limits as they vary around the world. And here, again, is this point one, um, point 0.1 value, which was, oops, I think I'm misspeaking here. That was the detection limit for the five degree north to south region. But you see that there are some regions where the detection limit is um, lower and other regions where it's higher. So this, this, um, the detection limit depends on where you are on, on the earth. And we've done uh, a, an, a lot of different ways of cutting and slicing this problem. Um, basically, these bullets summarize what we find, which some of which are rather intuitive. One is that detection is more likely in regions where the al background albedo is lower to begin with, um, where the variability is lower to begin with. Uh, the larger the intervention, of course, the easier detection is. The longer the intervention, the easier the detection is because you're smoothing out some of the, the noise. Um, the longer the prior record, the easier the detection also because you're better able to characterize the prior noise. So this speaks to the issue of the importance of, a, of an observing system that's sustained for a long time. Um, the lower your statistical significance level, of course, the more easy is your, your detection. And then if, you, um, if the interventions are not instantaneous and st sustained but have some temporal structure, then it's more difficult to uh, detect the change. I think I've run out of time. So um, I'll just conclude with this take-home message that is that um, albedo background variability is the main limitation to detection of solar radiation management. Thank you for your attention. My apologies. Thank you. We have time for one question, and that will be All Alan. That yeah, that will be Alan's question. <laughs> so, uh, if I wanted to detect SRM, I wouldn't use that method. I know, Alan, I because you always ask me this question. <laughs> Ways. I also would average over the whole world, not just the very narrow band. So I wish you would sort of add another take-home message that, that there are other ways to detect it, not using this, this 
I'll let you um, have the final word there. Uh, thank you for that. Okay, our next speaker is Trudis Strelvmo from Yale University, and um, she'll be talking about service clouds, uh, another climate engineering method. <laughs> 